In a previous video we saw that smart glasses are available in countries with 5G network, like Japan, but still need to overcome some technical challenges before they can become part of the daily life of consumers. These challenges are associated to fast processing, low latency, lightweight and power consumption. This is especially true when creating virtual or augmented reality content, the killer application of smart glasses. These are no small challenges for the new partnership between Facebook Reality Lab and eyewear manufacturer Essilor Luxotica, which plan to offer smart glasses starting next year. But Facebook smart glasses might not be the only option for those looking for a brand name. There is one name that should come to mind when talking about solving issues related to fast processing, low latency and balancing performance with low power. NVIDIA. So it should not come as a surprise if the company announced that they are working on smart glasses too. NVIDIA was exhibiting and presenting a SIGGRAPH 2020, the international event about computer graphics. Expo Vista TV attended the virtual event and we had a chance to learn about what the company is working on. The presenters and SIGGRAPH agreed to share the highlights of the presentations with our channel. NVIDIA is not planning to create a designer smart glasses for the consumers, but the focus on smart glasses is part of a general interest in the evolution of digital displays. It's reasonable to ask why displays? Why is NVIDIA working on displays? And the sort of obvious answer is this one, right? We come from a gaming background, gaming is in our DNA, and the display is your window into the game, into the world of the game, right? So whether that's you know, an atmospheric game like is displayed here, where this kid is sort of looking out through this window into this world of swords and sorcery and, you know, medieval towns, or a competitive game where somebody is playing a game to win. Uh, and, you know, that would be the world of esports. Uh, you know, it's clearly important to have a good display. It's going to add to the experience, and it turns out it's going to make you a better player. So that's the obvious reason, right? NVIDIA is interested in displays to improve the gaming experience. But there's another more subtle reason, which is that it's very important for us to understand the future graphics workloads, and displays are what are going to drive those future graphics workloads. Okay, so if the future displays are holographic, if the future displays are light field displays, if the future displays are very high frame rate, we would like to be among the first to know and understand that. And we want to drive the display research in a direction that will help us with our mission of providing sort of the best pixels to everybody in the world. In most presentations about smart glasses, the focus is on the applications, but there is not much attention to individuals that wear prescription glasses. And yet, according to NVIDIA's market data, individuals with some kind of vision issue represent 76% of the American population, and the number is even higher in Asian countries. But let's start with the issues associated to the current displays. So here's some of the designs out there now. You can I have sort of a flip up visor that, like the HoloLens 2, that can sort of move out of the way and then flip down on the other side of your glasses. You can buy built in prescription lenses. Uh, for example, Magic Leap supplied these uh, or InReal. Um, but all of these, all of these approaches have uh, a problem, a couple of problems. Uh, and, uh, you know, fundamentally, if you're putting the, you know, the front of your display, whether that's a display itself or some sort of image combiner for augmented reality that, that combines the real world and a virtual uh, display, uh, then you've, you've got to put it on the other side of the eyeglasses, on the other side of the prescription lens. And, and that dramatically increases the eye relief, right, the distance from the eye to the front of the display. Um, and and that's, that's one problem. Uh, to deal with, right? If, if it's harder to get a wide field, that desirable wide field of view, you know, the further away the, the display is from, from the eye. Um, another problem that these designs have is that uh, they, they kind of, by their nature, need to be, need to support uh, the, the full range of humans that are going to wear them. So interocular distance, in other words, the distance between the eyeballs, um, the numbers you usually hear are something like 58 to 72 millimeters, right, to capture kind of 99% of the of the users out there. So if you need to support, you know, a system where the eye might be, the eyeballs might be anywhere in this range, then you need a fairly large eye box. Whereas if you just had, if you knew, if you could customize this for an individual user, a particular person's interocular distance, then you could deal with a much smaller eye box. You simply need, at that point, you simply need to cover the amount of rotation that can happen uh, of the eyeball in its socket, and perhaps a little bit of slip, a little bit to account for slippage of the of the display on the nose of the uh, of the user. So the eye box required for a single viewer is smaller 
than the eye box required for a random viewer. That's important. And the distance, the eye relief is, is a problem, right? Having to put the display far away from the eyeball is a challenge. There are some exceptions to this approach, and they include solutions that build on a virtual retina display. For example, the Intel Vaughn project, which was canceled recently, or the Focals by North, which was recently purchased by Google. The basic idea of these systems is to put a small microprojector on the temple of the glasses and bounce it off of an holographic optical element, or HOE, that serves as the image combiner. The problem with these systems is that they end up with a very small eye box, and so they can really only project an image when your eye is in a particular spot. This makes it impossible to have a wide field of view. But there are people that are now working in finding a solution to this issue, and it can bring great advantages. On the right, you see the, the sort of the optical layout uh, that, that we're doing. This is prescription AR, is what we called it. And the idea is that you've got a little micro display, a little OED micro display, and a couple of um, a couple of lenses and, and sort of in coupling elements that couple the uh, the light from that display directly into the uh, optic that has the optical power of the prescription. So you've got your prescription lens. You take your eyeglass prescription. You build a a lens for that prescription that has has a little bit of extra thickness, and you use that to do this kind of triple bounce that you see um, as the the light comes in and bounces uh, through through the optic and off of this sort of half mirror, kind of halfway down directly in front of the eye that serves as the combiner and magnifier uh, to bring that light into the eye. Um, so uh, this system has uh, the advantage that it can be made, you know, quite small, quite thin, and it is the glasses, right? It is the prescription, uh, and therefore you don't need an extra thing on the other side of the prescription lenses. This, this replaces your, your prescription lenses with something that's thin and light enough that you can comfortably wear it all day. So the um, here's an example of it working. You know, we've simulated 1D myopia by defocusing the camera appropriately, and so one diopter myopia, and, um, and now we've uh, put the glasses on with a display showing this NVIDIA logo, and you can see that, in fact, the eye chart, Snellen chart in the distance is now in focus, as is the NVIDIA logo, which is placed at that same optical depth. Uh, so uh, this is exciting, and uh, it really builds on and is based on this idea of customization. Once you sort of embrace the idea that you're going to customize the display for the user, that you're going to place the display, uh, you know, the eye box of the display in a spot that works for this user, you know, with this style of glasses that they like to wear and the way that they like to wear the glasses sort of on their nose, on their brow. Uh, once you embrace that idea, then it unlocks uh, a lot of possibilities, especially around form factor. And uh, and so, you know, our vision is that you would use something like a, a scan from your, your mobile phone uh, and you could uh, use that to design, to build sort of a parameterized frame design that would then be, you know, used for the customized AR display. Um, and that would give you the correct pupil position and eye relief. Uh, and, and so I'm going to come back to this idea of customization. Let me point out one more advantage of this approach. Um, think about uh, the real world AR experience, right? Sort of the social experience you have interacting with somebody who is in augmented reality. Right, the whole point of them being in augmented reality is they can still interact with the real world. And yet, if you're using these diffractive, opti these diffractive optics that you find, for example, in the HoloLens or the Magic Leap, then uh, you've got this very unnatural light leakage coming out that's kind of intrinsic to the display. Um, and you, you can't make eye contact with them at all. Um, uh, the the birdbath optics that you find, for example, on the InReal glasses uh, or Google Glass, uh, and to a lesser extent, the pin mirror optics that you find in Letin AR, um, all have this uh, this problem that that you can see you you sort of get an image of what the user is looking at. So there's kind of a privacy issue there. We still have kind of this slightly awkward eye contact situation uh, with the birdbath optics, and plus there's this additional sort of privacy issue that you know, if you look close enough, you can kind of see what they're looking at. Um, so on the right hand side, you see the prescription AR, this sort of free form optic that I described to you, uh, where the micro LED uh, is you know, relayed into the lens. And so obviously the micro LED would be concealed in a real design, uh, in, you know, in a real industrial design. Uh, so concentrate on, on what you see here. With this particular prototype that we built, had a transparency of 70% for the, for the image combiner. Uh, you know, uh, you can't really see what the user is looking at. 
Um, nor, but you can see their eye, right? And if we made this even a little bit more transparent by cranking up the brightness of the LED more, then uh, you would you would quite easily be able to make eye contact with them and feel like you were you were looking at them. You could see what they were looking at. You could see if they were looking at you. Um, so uh, so this is this is we think a very promising direction, uh, and uh, it made us think a little bit more about how would you design this to actually be a, 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 con, a viable consumer product or say an enterprise product, something for specific users, maybe doctors or, or people who, you know, in various jobs who might want to have augmented reality some of the time, but don't necessarily need it all of the time. And, and so we came up with this idea that uh, what we call modular, modular AR, get it, where essentially the, 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 the optics are built into the lenses that you are already wearing uh, for your eyeglasses and then the the uh, the AR display kind of snaps on with magnets. So uh, so now the AR display is not like a Hololens or Magic Leap with a whole um, with a whole bunch of electronics on your on your head. It's it's the minimum absolute minimum number of electronics in this little snap on module. And so you know on the left you see sort of a, a simple prototype that we three D printed that is you know an actual display with uh, you know or an actual set of prescription optics. The whole thing weighs about thirty six grams. And then the prototype that we built with the, uh, the micro LEDs and their driver board, which could get, be significantly miniaturized if this was a real product, I should say. And that one weighed, uh, you know, 62 grams total. Although it's worth saying we didn't have a cable or a radio attached, so 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 that was that's you know a little disingenuous in that it doesn't actually have any connection to something that can drive those micro displays. Um, but it gives us kind of the speed of light. It gives us the um, you know what we're aiming for. Um, you don't screw it on. You just kind of click it on and off and uh, you can see it kind of snap on and off. Yeah. Okay, so I think this is this is a very good form factor, especially for sort of a three D printed prototype. It's basically a pair of graph, uh, glasses that has a bit of a wavy structure in it that you can sort of see if you look carefully at at Jung Hyun's eyes. This AR mode. Very lightweight, 36 grams, cable weight would have to be solved or replaced by some sort of very low power radio. And both the real scene and the, the AR image are very clear, uh, you know, because this is in fact, you know, prescription AR is the same thing. These are the issues that NVIDIA is trying to solve, so that even individuals with vision issues can access content in virtual reality. But the company is also very much involved in the research targeting more general challenges of virtual reality. What follows is a short summary of these challenges, and we will explore them in future videos. So this would be a good time to subscribe to this channel. For virtual reality, you need near eye display. In other words, you need to somehow put a display so close to your eye that, that your eye can't focus on it, and yet you need to be able to focus on it. So you need some there's sort of an optical an optics challenge there. You need a wide field of view because the human eye can see an extraordinarily wide field of view, and the human eye is exquisitely sensitive. Like where you are directly looking at something, you have incredible sort of roughly one arc minute resolution uh, in your eye. And so you need to support very high resolution across that very wide field of view. You need to do all this in a design that is, you know, not too bulky to wear on your face. And of course, the less bulky, the better. Ideally, you'd get, like to get this down to something that approaches eyeglasses. You also need to think about the eye box. The eye box is, is a term for this region where the eyeball can be located and still see the image. And there's, there's a lot of evidence, I'm not going to go into it here, that, that it's important to get focus cues right. In other words, in the, real, in the real world, objects are at different optical distances, so you need to get, and so if you're focused on one thing, other things are going to be blurry and vice versa. You need to support the ability of the eye to accommodate to and focus on different things at different depths. And augmented reality inherits all of these challenges from virtual reality, plus you've got to worry about making a screen that is bright enough that you can see it if you walk outdoors. Um, and yet that is clear enough that is, you know, does not attenuate too much, so much that if you walk indoors, it'll be like sunglasses and you'll have to take it off to see. So brightness and attenuation, you need to worry about diffraction, uh, especially diffraction of the real world. Many uh, augmented reality displays depend on holographic or diffractive optical elements that can end up putting sort of rainbows, airy disks around everything uh, that you see in the real world. Occlusion, it would be nice if synthetic objects, you know, virtual objects, appear to occlude, appear to block out the real world objects behind them, which is enormously challenging. And you need to think about the fact that the user probably has a prescription, right? They might be myopic, nearsighted, they might be presbyopic, they might have that age-related farsightedness, they might have astigmatism or, or other, uh, other prescriptions, and, and you need to support that.